Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. A choice. I got a mandate. You get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for sharing the show. We love that about you. A uh, legendary DJ and comedian and humorist Frazier Smith is in studio. Frazier's got a podcast called Puck Off, and wherever you find finer podcasts, that's that's uh, it's hockey based. We'll get into that. Got some live dates and things like that. Uh, Frazier Smith, I was probably introduced to as a young boy living in North Hollywood, California. Seeing you on TV doing commercials for your incredibly successful morning radio tour out here on KLOS, I'm guessing, back in the day. Yep, KLOS. Yep. It was... Um, I, I I always had an attraction to radio. I, I just loved I just loved radio. I, I didn't even know what it was or who was in it or how it worked, but the notion of doing a free formed comedy daily morning radio show and was incredible to my young mind. And then also, I was oh, later on. I became the perfect listener because I work construction. And construction started at 7 a.m., uh, which meant I had to be in my truck about 6.15. And then I'd listen to morning radio all the way to the job site or into the cabinet shop or wherever I was working. And then once I got to the place I was working, I'd turn it, the radio, the job box on to morning radio and listen all the way through to the end. So I was one of the few guys who probably listened to Three hours and 45 minutes of a four-hour four, four hour format back in the day. You poor guy. <laughs> you had to put up with that. But Frazier was probably the first big, I guess, FM morning guy out here. Is that accurate? That's probably true. Yeah, I think so. Um, there were, I guess, some guys before that, uh, Robert W. Morgan, yeah, guys like that, uh, who I didn't really get to hear because I wasn't out here. Uh, and, but I think I was one of the first, and I used to get handwritten letters from Stern, from Howard Stern. Saying, really? Yeah. He would say, "How do you get? How do you get the, your show on the air like this?" Because uh, he he was, was go, he hadn't done his show yet, so I would get. <laughs> he hadn't done his morning, he had yeah. morning or syndication. I think the morning show. So he's really? asking for advice. Yeah. Wow. Which is always uh, sketchy when it's me. <laughs> but uh yeah i used to get letters from howard it's and funny the rock stations out here were klos and kmet kmet is defunct now but kmet was a huge rock station in the later 70s or early 80s mid 80s a legendary station yeah yeah how did that and you were young when you started over there like how how did that pilgrimage work from detroit well, you know, I was on in Detroit, and uh, when I got here, I asked some friends of mine, uh, from they were from Detroit, and I said, well, what's a good station for me to get on out here? And they said, well, try K-Rock, because it's, kind of, it's probably the smallest of the bigger stations. So I called up K-Rock, and uh, just on a cold call, and uh, the management there said, well, I don't know, we don't know who you are. So I, ha I got a hold of Phil Austin, who was from Firesign Theater, and I don't know if you remember them, they were like a comedy group, mm -hmm. you know, from the uh, 70s. And they said, well, if you have a name with, uh, with you, you can do it. We'll put you on. So I got on K-Rock on Sunday night. We had a show called Hollywood Night Shift. 1976? Uh, yeah, 76. I mean, K-Rock was in its infancy. Well, we were in the uh, Pasadena Ho Hilton Hotel. We were in a, a suite in the hotel. And you'd walk in, there's like room service trays piled up. Uh, and this old-fashioned equipment. I was used to, like, a pretty big station in Detroit. I get there, and it's like, uh, you know, old Flash Gordon uh, twist pot right, stuff. tubes. And, yeah. And uh, I remember Phil Austin saying, "What? what is this? He goes, it's like a Mexican movie. And uh, it was a really surreal setting. So we started there, and then they moved across the street to the uh, little dress shop that they were going to uh, use as a studio until they built their new studios. At K-Rock in K -Rock. Pasadena. Yeah. And then, uh, so we're right there across from the Hilton, and Van Halen was the lounge band at the Van ha at the uh, Hilton. Right. They'd be doing those shows. <clears throat> and then uh, David Lee Roth would come across the street and climb up on the, f on the fire escape through a window 
and kick in the door to the studio and try to get me to play their test pressing. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah, people may not know that uh, Van Halen was a Pasadena, Pasadena band. Yeah. Ban. Played Dr. Drew's prom? I, I, I try to figure that out because I know Scott, uh, Snotty Scotty and the Hankies played at a prom that Dr. Drew went to. Oh, maybe that's what it was. It was always, yeah. But he was asked to go to other people's proms, too. And maybe Van Halen, I think, probably did. I knew did. Scotty, too. Scotty, you know. You knew Snotty Scotty? Oh, yeah. And the Hankies? Yeah, sure. They had a bigger career than Van Halen. I don't know why everyone's <laughs> talking about Van they Halen did. this and Van know. Halen that. I, I should have played their test pressing. So, really, so, I mean, David Lee Roth, 19-year-old David Lee Roth would yeah, come over there? Yeah, and so I played, you know, something. I finally played something to get him off my back, and uh, it was uh, Ain't Talking About Love off the first album. I think that's their best rock song. Best it's intro. A great song. Yes. Yeah. Great yes, song. best guitar, that guitar lick. intro is yes. insane. Yes. That that song it. kicks ass in the in the rock department. Yeah, it's a good song and and uh that was what K-Rock was famous for then because Rodney Bingenheimer, who you know, uh was working for NME, which is the uh English equivalent of a Rolling Stone magazine. Mm -hmm. So he knew all the English bands that were coming. Rodney up. on the rock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he would tell us, well, play these guys. Well, who are they? The Police. So you you know nobody knew any of these bands, right? And you'd play them, and all of a sudden everybody in town was listening to K Rock, Little K Rock. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, what it was is these bigger kind of legacy stations, KMT, KLOS. At the time, they're playing like a lot of Thirty Eight Special and and right. uh, you know Blue Oyster Cult and Ario Speedwagon and stuff like that. And you, so you have to have to think that's all everyone was hearing. And then all of a sudden, you're hearing the police. You're hearing old Joe Jackson, you're Clash. Elvis Costello, Elvis, Clash. Sure. And you're going like, what? what is this? Like, what is this new music? And so K-Rock started playing new wave yeah. music, which is oftentimes British. Yes. And, and you know, and punk rock and, and all that stuff. Rodney was into all of it. You know, and he helped a lot of those uh, uh, mainstream bands, too, to make it big. You know, Well, there's all those stories about, um, you know, later a little, like, you know, Gwen Stefani from No Doubt, you know, and the girls from, uh, from um, the Bengals and the Go-Go's, uh, go yeah. like baking cookies and yeah. showing up and knocking on yeah. the door. <laughs> they were all there. They were all what were some of the fun ways that bands would like try to do? I mean, obviously, payola was a big thing back then too in your business. But like, what were some of the different ways that bands would would have to ask to get their music played? Like David Lee Roth kicking in the window, or well, uh, cocaine was always a good, of course, uh, entree. Uh, you know, back then it was the party era, so yeah, people would bring all the different party favorites. Listen, I've said it many times. It was the best time is in this nation's history is pre-AIDS, mid-Coke. Yep. AIDS didn't exist. Fuck whoever you wanted. Didn't matter. And Coke wasn't even bad for you or stigmatized. <laughs> right. matter of fact, the Coke would get you laid. Everything was yeah. awesome. Oh, and yeah. you just yeah. get laid without a rubber in the <laughs> closet, and, and who cared? That was a good era. You were living large yeah. in that pre-AIDS, mid-Coke era. I was. So these guys, and, and so people started to figure out if you want your music played, you got to get it to K-Rock. K-Rock didn't have a format. K-Rock was just whatever the jocks liked right. in particular. Yeah, when you when you yeah. uh, got the job at Kerrick, when we were looking into it, how how was it described to you? How was the station described to you? Like, did you know what it was, really? No, I had no idea. And and uh, I'm coming from a pretty established station in Detroit, you know, and a pretty big-time station. They were kind of like the KLOS of, of uh, Detroit. So this was really lowball stuff for me, I thought. But then K-Rock started to take off with this kind of uh, weird format, this kind of loosey-goosey format, and it started to really build. And all of a sudden, we were beating all the uh, big stations in the ratings. Yeah, people should watch. What is the Rodney Doc? Is it the uh, mayor of the Mayor Sunset? of Sunset Strip. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very <laughs> it's sad. It is sad. But, but it explains a lot. Yeah. And... Rodney Bingenheimer was um, uh, the least likely on-air talent, but all all the K-Rock talent 
save Fraser Smith over here, were not on air talent. No, they, they were all like used car dealers and weed dealers and just a motley crew of. I think it's, it would make a great movie. Uh, because, we're working on a doc right now. Ah, yeah, very good, very good. Because there's so much to tell, but you hear, you hear. I, I don't know. Find a you know, find a clip of Rodney Bing and I were like doing a bad interview, like. <laughs> that could be almost any. That could be any interview. Yeah, yeah. But, Find him but, speaking. But I, I, it's like you you would sit around and go, "This guy is talking into a microphone for a living, and he's the least likely character to ever speak." Especially, you know, now it's all about personality yeah. in in all facets of entertainment, in comedy, music, whatever. Back then, you had to have a radio voice. Like, radio guys were radio guys. Right, yeah. they, first thing you had was a voice. So why do you think he was so influential then? He knew all the bands. He knew the up-and-coming bands. That was his big uh, claim to fame. Right. And he had a good ear. you got to yeah. give him credit on that. He picked a lot of bands before anybody else did. Uh, my first night on, on the radio here in Los Angeles, uh, I met Tom Petty, uh, Bl- uh, Deborah Harry from Blondie, Blondie, uh, a couple of the Sex Pistols, their manager, <laughs> and, and there's a couple of the Ramones. Night this one. is my first night on the air, <laughs> and nobody knew who any of them were, right? And none of them had any product out, even Tom Petty, nothing. Yeah, uh, it was, and and Rodney said they're all going to be stars. Yeah, and we're coming from a world of listening to just pretty much Bob Seger. And all of a sudden, Ronnie's trying to tell you about Depeche Mode, and we're yeah. like, who? What is that? Some kind of fucking sorbet? What's Depeche yeah. Mode? It all seemed weird. Yeah, that's and, right. And yet, the the success of K-Rock was letting weirdos with real good ears pick their own stuff that nobody had ever heard of before, and then foist it on people, and it had to be good, otherwise people wouldn't request it but yeah that was uh that was the genius of k-rock but k-rock was a ragtag oh, a totally unprofessional and i'm i was surprised that you did mornings there. i even forgot about, about well that. yeah what happened there was that uh i got really big on k-rock because of what you said it was kind of a viral thing before there was viral all of a sudden everybody's listening to the station it was just at right time right place and uh, all of a sudden, so everybody's listening to my show, and then KLOS came after me because I was hot. At that oh, time. that's how you get to KLOS. Yeah. We have we have Rodney Bingenheimer interviewing Van Halen from 1980 or something. I guess I don't know what year it is, but we can listen. <laughs> and um, <laughs> we couldn't have done it without you either, Rodney. Tell us about this tape we're going to play in a few minutes. What happened about that? All right, well, we were playing one night, and some of the fellas from Kiss came down to see the band, who you brought along <laughs> to see, and they came by and said, Ooh, uh, <laughs> A couple days later, we were in New York City doing a little tape recording down Electric Ladyland Studios. So uh, what we have here is one hell of a demo tape, and this is something that we're showing people around, and people are being, you know... 1976. Um, this is the first radio play we've ever gotten. There's just yeah. a tape here, but uh, we're proud to be on the rocks of Los Angeles. What's it called? This is called Running With The Devil. Oh, yeah, there, there he is. 1976. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> and Rodney yeah. Bingenheimer. Who, he was the guy, you know. Um, and he and knew right. like David Bowie and Mick Jagger. And somehow knew everybody. Well, How he was did. he so dialed in? Well, I don't know. He worked can... at NME. That's why. Because that's the big, that's the, uh, you know, Rolling Stone of, of England. So uh, he, he was like a stringer for them. And so he knew about all these bands in advance, and he had a club on Sunset. That's right. Not far from the Laugh Factory called uh, Rodney's English Disco. Right. And I never went there. I got here after it was gone. But um, when you, uh, my friends tell me when you would walk in, it was a tiny place, and you'd see the Who sitting in one booth, and then Led Zeppelin would be in another booth. All the English bands would go there as soon as they got off the plane so they could get a Guinness and, and hang out. The... Uh the the moral of the story for people is if if you're very interested in something as Rodney was, you can basically will yourself to success 
if you just do it, like you just get up every day and live it because he's the most unlikely radio jock star That's in the world yeah. and somehow ingratiated himself. He, he just made his way into this world and sort of took it over super quietly. And the thing that's always weird about him is it's not like the guy had a lot of gumption or brass balls. <laughs> you know, he didn't walk in and go out of the way boys. And listen to me. He just would, <laughs> he would slink into the room and whisper, like right. talk stuff, like look at his feet while he was talking, and then somehow leave with David Bowie and a few models. <laughs> like, I, it, it's true. It, it's crazy. Yeah, it's true. And uh, and all the models would hang out at his show. Oh goddamn! I get off the air and it'd be models everywhere. I mean, you must have to do a morning shift back in those crazy days. I mean, you must have had some, like, all-nighters and stuff. You know, I was an idiot, and uh, still am, by the way. But I, I I was a real party animal guy and would try to, you know, go out and clubbing, because clubbing was, was really happening then. You know, the Sunset Strip was popping. My buddy ran the whiskey. My other buddy ran the, uh, the rainbow. Uh, you know, and so you'd go up and down the Strip. All kinds of stuff's happening. So you're up by almost every night. And there's new bands coming into town. All these new bands were playing the whiskey. And then I try to get up and do the morning show on like an hour's sleep. And that wasn't a great idea. After a while, that catches up to you. But I had a lot of fun for the first couple of years. And then you go, so you go to KLOS, and then you end up at KMET, which is probably where I saw your commercials. But maybe it was KLOS. KLOS is where I, I did the commercials where I had my boss tied up. What's the name? Larry Summers? Uh, Bill Summers. Bill Summers. Bill Summers. Uh, and I uh, never really got along. We, <laughs> I, I pride myself on getting along with everybody, but that one wasn't working. And there's commercials that I would watch when I was 13 of like uh, Frazier is in his boss's office who runs the radio station. He's got him like tied up and gagged on his desk. Yeah. And Frazier's like jumping on the desk, doing what he wants. And I was like, this guy's an outlaw. <laughs> so morning radio show outlaw. And this is rock and roll. And this is crazy. Just, you know, the, just the notion that they would run TV ads for their morning radio guy. That was pretty cool that they did that. And uh, I, lo I love doing those commercials. But unfortunately, it was actually kind of true. Bill really didn't like me. And uh, it was a negotiations thing. And at one point, I remember uh, we were in a negotiation, and it wasn't going well. And he had my car towed out of the parking lot because I used to park in his spot because it was the closest one to the station. And I was always coming in from partying all night. So I'd, I'd park in his spot, and then I'd go and move it later during a, when we were playing a record. And I forgot to move it one day, so he towed my car. So I had said on the air, I go, if you see a, a silver Cadillac with license plates too hip, because that was my slogan, too hip, I go, give the guy the finger. So I had a lot of fans at that point. Everybody in town was flipping them off at every stoplight. And Bill just hated me. <laughs> so I don't know how we got that commercial done, but... Well, don't you think what? you need that resistance from the producer in the town? Like, I mean, Stern yeah. did it a lot, too, and that kind of showed how... Yeah. How much of an outlaw or badass they were because they'd be fighting against the man. Yeah, I guess. I got lucky in that I started radio at night. I started, I mean, really started doing radio. My job started at 10 p.m. So everyone was sort of home. You know, didn't have to deal with the program director yeah, or the GM. That's a plus. You, you know, you could, you know, in radio, you, you're doing mornings or any other shift, like working hours. You say something, you do something, you walk out of the studio, the guy's standing there. Like, that's that's a weird element of a job. You, you know what I mean? Where it's like you're talking shit, and the person <laughs> you're talking shit about is standing, waiting for you when you walk out of your out of the booth. We did, um, we did, uh, I, mean, I keep, keep wanting to say podcast <laughs> one, uh, Westwood. We did Westwood one, Westwood one and yeah. uh, there's no one in the building. You know, we didn't we didn't have to deal with the bosses. And frankly, they didn't stay up at night and listen either. No, they so we didn't have don't. to we yeah. didn't have to deal with it. What kind of pay was going around back then, like at the height of your powers? You know what kind of contracts were those? It was okay, but you know, it's kinda like uh Well let's talk numbers. Like I wanna <laughs> know. I I, I think the most I ever made was uh hundred and seventy five thousand. 
Yeah. For doing mornings. You know, it's kind of like if you Dodger paid in that era and Dodger paying now. You know, that same kind of thing. It was pre Stern and all the big money. I never got the big, big money. Um, but at that time, everything was less expensive, too. So I still did okay. Yeah, I, mean, I think it was kind of like sports, you yeah, know, and yeah. that, you know, you made a good living playing professional baseball back in the 70s or something, but you didn't get rich right, like, like, right. They, like they do now. So you go from K- – you go from K-Rock to k to k t and then what happens at k t Well, k t uh, was an amazing station, first of all. You know, it was typical of all those big AOR stations, big rock stations across the country, but it was probably the best one. They just had a great staff. You know, it was Jim Ladd, and it was uh, Jeff Gonzer and, and Cynthia Fox, and and Paraquat Kelly, uh, <laughs> Paraquat Kelly. Uh, you know what Paraquat is? Never heard the name. No one knows what Paraquat is. I think Paraquat was the agent. It was the roundup of its time. Paraquat. Do you know what Paraquat is? Sorta. It was u- they sprayed uh, it, it on was, weed. It to, was used to kill pot. To kill weed plants. Yeah. <laughs> like the the feds yeah. would load up the crop dusters you know, fly over the hills of Oregon <laughs> and spray Just poison all over the place, which they could they could there never never do today. So yeah. if your name was Paraquat Kelly, which probably wasn't his Christian name, but Paraquat Kelly was like weed eater, Roundup Kelly. Yeah. But it was a defiant pot thing. I That's think. what it was, yeah. And he, Pat Kelly was his name, and his dad was the announcer for the Rams. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, and Pat was cool. That it was a cool station. Uh, Shadow Stevens was the boss for a while. So and he came up with the upside down KMET thing. Remember they had the cool yeah. billboards. Uh, the marketing there was real cool. Oh, you would see bumper stickers for KLOS, KMET, K Rock. I mean, there was just it, you would just see stickers for the radio. They would do sticker stops. Where yeah. They would just hand out stickers. You know, yeah. like it was a big. It deal, was a, yeah. That, gra- that stuff went on well to like the late '90s, early 2000s, even. Yeah, yeah. Well, they always really pushed their promos. They had money back then. And K Rock also had to. K Rock started not started out, but turned quickly into K Rock Rock of the '80s. But they had to figure that one out as the '80s when it got to the to '90s. Get to the get to the end. Yeah. Wow. So um, you come out now. What do you do after radio or after after KMT? Well, you know, I did some acting, a little bit of acting, and I did some, um, st- I started doing stand-up, mm-hmm. you know, and my buddy was uh, the guy that owns the Laugh Factory, Jamie Masada. Right. And Jamie was the sidekick on my radio show. He was Buddy Buddy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's the typical foreign guy who butchered the language and was just kind of uh, the goofy sidekick. And uh, then he bought the Laugh Factory. So all of a sudden he's saying, "Well, Fraze, you got to come down and do the host the shows here at the Laugh Factory." So I started doing that, and that's how I got into stand up. And uh, I became kind of a local. I was hosting all kinds of stuff in town, and bands too. I'd bring up bands at the Starwood, and the Whiskey, and uh, Roxy, and all those places. And then I would do my stand up at uh, all the clubs in town, Ice House, and I got some. Uh... We gotta take a break, but I got some musical stuff I want to get into that's not quite K Rock format, but but I it's interesting. And then we'll tell you guys tell me whether this is kismet or coincidence or or you know, telepathy. I don't know, but uh, we'll get into that. We'll talk more with Fraser Smith. We'll do that right after this. Let me tell you about Turo Innovative. It's the world's largest car sharing marketplace with Turo. You can book any car you want, wherever you want, from a community of local hosts. Browse a huge selection of vehicles for just about any occasion or budget. Book an SUV or minivan for a family road trip, a pickup truck for some errands, or even test drive an EV. Every trip is backed by liability insurance. Terms, conditions, and exclusions apply. Find your drive. Forget your boring rental cars at Taro, T-U-R-O dot com. 
Electric e-bikes. Oh, dads are hard to shop for in general. Well, never mind my dad. I don't know if he knows it's Father's Day coming up. But anyway, if you're struggling what to get your dad for Father's Day, give him the gift of fun, powerful, and uh, an easy way to tool around outside. That's electric e-bike. Oh, these things are great. I The greatest joy I had all football season last year was me and my son hopping on our electric e-bikes and riding them to watch uh, football at the warehouse with the boys. I mean, you can just get around so fast, so efficiently on these things. Quality, feature-filled models, finance as low as 73 bucks a month, plus you'll reduce your gas costs and carbon footprint in LA. I mean, gas starts with a five out here, so this baby pays for itself. Includes a powerful removable battery, bright LCD display, seven speed gearing, five levels of pedal assistance for your ride. You go up to 28 miles an hour. It's just the best. It's foldable. It ships fully assembled. It, you got to get one. It's electric e-bike. Right, Dawson? Skip the played out gifts this Father's Day and give the gift of adventure with electric e-bikes. Visit electricebikes.com to learn more and explore the epic models electric has to offer. That's L E C T R I C E bikes.com. Tommy John, ah, your uh, balls probably stick into your thigh right about now. That's right. Summer's heating up. It's only going to get worse. Tommy John. They are the cooling solution to your sticky situations. I'm wearing Tommy John's right now. It's it's all I wear. Once you get into it, you don't get out of it. That's all. You're so much more comfortable. You do everything better. Dozens of comfort innovations. Breathable, lightweight, moisture-wicking fabric with four times the stretch of competing brands can help you stay seven degrees cooler. That's right, seven degrees more cooler downstairs than uh, cotton briefs can. Over 20 million pairs sold, thousands of five-star reviews. Tommy John, they don't have customers, they have fanatics. And like I said, you will get into your Tommy John's and you'll never go back. Just please trust me on that. It's Tommy John, right, Dawson? Shop Tommy John's Summer Collection and get 20% off your first order at TommyJohn.com slash Adam. Save 20% right now at TommyJohn.com slash Adam. See site for details. Frazier Smith, legendary morning show personality, DJ, stand-up in studio. Uh, so tell me what you uh, think of this. I was, uh, I woke up, as you get older, you have things kind of pop in your head when you're somewhere between asleep and awake in the morning. Right. Weird old things that happen, songs, stuff you haven't thought about in a, in a million years. So several days back, I'm laying in bed and something I've never thought about and a song I've never thought about since I talked to my old neighbor, Eddie Gravich about it when I was like nine years old is this uh, song. And I know who I I thought Johnny Cash did it, but it's called uh, dang me. Oh, I remember that. Uh, Yeah. Hold on a second. Um, He had a couple uh, big hits. Yeah. King of the Road. King of the Road, right. So, I, I'm, I'm just, I, and, and then all week, just because that's the way I'm wired, I'm just, dang, dang, oh, I'll take a rope and hang me. And, and I'm like, how did this make its way into my head? Because I haven't brought it up ever. And it's been many, many years since I was singing it with my neighbor. I was nine or 10 years old. And, then, and, I'm, and I've just was, and I kept walking around for the next few days. And I was like, why is this song in my head? Where'd it come from? I don't own it. I don't, I think it's, at the, I think it's a Johnny Cash song. Sounds but, like Cash a little bit. But yeah. that's all I knew from country growing up in North Hollywood. Like if there was a country song, it was like, well, Johnny Cash must have sung it because I don't know <laughs> the name of any other country, country artist. Country artist, yeah. And so I'm just walking around and over the next few days and I keep, just thing keeps popping up. Dang me. Dang, and uh, I don't know where it came from. And then at some point, I find myself in Nashville, and I'm sitting backstage, getting ready to do some uh, thing with uh, C. Thomas Howell. It's a long story, but either way, he's got a band. Blah blah blah. And I'm, I'm just sitting on the sofa in the green room in the back, and I'm, I'm and I'm still like, dang, where did this come <laughs> from? But I'm not saying anything out loud. And then uh, Larry Gatlin. Of oh, the Gatlin yeah, brothers, sure. 
sits down next to me and we're friendly and he's a great guy. And he just starts talking and he starts talking and he talks and he can talk and he's going, uh, yeah, man, I miss all the great songwriters and, uh, Roger Miller, man, that guy was a great songwriter, great song. And what a lyricist and funny, funny. And I'm like, Oh, King of the road, that guy. Right. And he's like, King of the road and dang me. And I'm oh, like, here we go. And I'm like, yeah. dang me. Like, yeah. I ought to take a rope and hang. Me. I'm like, yeah, he wrote that song. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, why'd you bring that up? And he's like, I'm bringing up Roger Miller. I was like, Roger Miller died, you know, 31 years ago. And I didn't bring him up. And I didn't even know Larry Gatlin was going to be back backstage. And he, so I'm, I'm walking around on a, on a Wednesday with Dangme. <laughs> but I'm not saying anything to anybody because no one I know knows the song or they wouldn't know or they wouldn't care or why bother or whatever it is. But not Larry Gatlin. He brings Larry it, knew. He knew, and I didn't bring it up to him. He That's brought funny. it up to me. That is kismet. So weird. I was just like looking at him. But then I, he starts talking about Roger Miller. And the guy, he guys, that guy was a genius. He was a crazy comedic lyricist. And then I was thinking about... You know, when I was like 15, I remember listening to the song King of the Road like 10 times in a row. Uh, not my record. I didn't, you know, we didn't have country records or anything, but someone else had it. And I was like thinking about the lyrics to it when I was 15. I was like, they're really interesting. Then uh, Larry Gatlin and I did a 25 minute uh, dialogue about Roger Miller and I was <laughs> listening and I was going oh yeah that guy that guy turns phrases and he was like the hey, funniest dude in the world greatest lyrics and I, and I was like yeah lyrics mean something well and that was a novelty record back then that was a hit oh yeah it was comedy novelty stuff and and every once in a while they'd come out um, I was I was writing a script called uh, Shecky and the Jets and it's about uh Comedy in the fifties up in the Catskills, mm. and remember Alan Sherman? Sure, he had the, a song called Camp Granada. Yeah, same Hello kind of Mata. Yeah, same Hello kind of thing. Fada. And all of a sudden, that stuck in my head. It's so funny. I was sitting in the hotel in Nashville after talking to Larry Gatlin, and they played the song um, "Benny and the Jets." from uh, Elton John, and I thought, I never have to hear this fucking song ever again. Like, I, I, it, it doesn't end. It doesn't really begin. Like, how did this become a hit? But it's funny that you just brought up uh, Benny and the Jets or Benny and the... Shecky and the Jets. Shecky and the Jets, because I was sitting around going, I never want to hear Benny and the Jets ever again. I don't know anyone who likes Benny. Listen, there's a song called Daniel. It's a great Elton John song. It's never, ever goddamn played. Benny and the Jets gets played 7,000 times for every one time Daniel gets played. Daniel is short. <laughs> it's poignant. It's sweet. It moves. It has an ending. Benny and the Jets sucks ass, and yet it's just perpetually pushed out. They always play the wrong stuff. They yeah. play the wrong stuff. Yeah, they right. do. And that's always a battle that DJs have with brass. Right. Right? It's always like, uh, hey, man, why are you playing that for the two millionth time? I had, Nobody uh, likes that. I had one of the, my earliest conversations with my, one of my first program directors was, look, man, we all own ZEP4, and none of us are racing home to play Stairway to Heaven. Right. Exactly. Can we please stop it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, deeper cut. Yeah, what, what, yeah. Ends up, what ends up making you angry is like, when the band or the artist or the whomever you're talking about has great hits that they don't play and then they play the shit. So it's like Albert Brooks has great movies, but he has a couple that are kind of stinkers. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, Mother and the, the other one where he played like a baseball scout or something. So you could be watching Lost in America defending or, your life. or Defending Your Life, but instead you watch the Scout movie over and <laughs> over again, and the guy runs the cable station. He's like, that is the, that's the Albert Brooks movie we're going to play. And it's like, yeah, Albert Brooks has good movies that we could be watching. But no. more people like Programmers Rodney. never know what they're doing. Yeah. Yes. Right? Am I right? I mean, most of the time, right? 
They're idiots. <laughs> yeah, they will. The program directors are failed DJs. That's, That's a lot why. of time. They That's wanted true, yeah, to be a yeah, DJ yeah. and it didn't work out. Were there some bands that that came out that you thought that you were just wrong about? Either they they became huge, thinking you you thought they were nothing, or vice versa. You thought this band was going to be huge and they just didn't make it. You know that? Yeah, plenty of times. I you know I, I I'm, the I'm ones you're wrong about are better. I mean the one the problem with the game of the ones you thought were going to be huge and who never made it, we'll never, we don't know the we'll name. Know, yeah. But the better one are the ones you thought who sucked. Yeah, and that happened plenty of times. I would tell Rodney, no, come on, man. That's not. Well, do you remember any of the. I don't, well, a lot of. I remember uh, Elvis Costello initially. Oh. And then later I was. You thought he was weird, right? Yeah. I just didn't get it. He did the weird broken ankle dance. <laughs> They were like he'd yeah, fold yeah. his ankles out and be all weird. Uh, by the way, he just wore weird glasses. That was enough. Like that dude's weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. There he is. Uh, and then later, I'm a huge fan now. Yeah. So you're wrong about Elvis Costello. Uh, yeah, and probably several others. I can't, I can't remember exactly, but I remember having uh, Poison on my show at KMET, and they were great. They're great guys, Poison. And but I just didn't get it, and and I was like, eh, I don't know about that. And then now, then now they're huge. Well, they yeah. certainly were. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, or were huge. Yeah, right. And um, you know, I, when I was the big uh, DJ guy, I would go to the uh, the Rainbow. That's where all the bands hung out, right? And you go still in there. Do. They still <laughs> do, but there back last then night, they they were really hanging out there. And and I would leave with my pockets filled with cassettes because it was a cassette. Oh, right. Era, and every <laughs> one of them came up to me. Hey, man. For, you got to play this, bro. And I, okay. And I just put it in my pocket and I get home and throw it in the box and I would never listen to it. And I remember one time I, I go, I, I was home for some reason and I go, all right, I'm going to listen to some of these. And I listened to uh, Motley Crue and uh, Livewire was the song. So I just, I loved the song. I go, that's a great song. I played it the next day, almost got me fired. My boss called up and goes, what is that? Take that off. I go, no, dude, that's a great song. Uh, sometimes you had to go toe to toe with the program director to get a song played, and it went through the roof. Back then, if the phones lit up, that was your—that's how it went viral, you know. And uh, you know, I just—I just hit me when I played the the cassette. It's crazy how analog everything was, but that we still figured out a way to get everything done. You know, yeah. No cell phones, no emails, all analog, no nothing. Well, you got to hit. physically like hand people cassettes and stuff, but yet it, it, they found a way. Like they, we know who they are. It worked I, somehow. It did. You're right. It, it did. I have a weird story like that though. Um, <clears throat> I went to a charity event, and I'm a big hockey fan, and I have my puck off podcast, and I, I got stuck. I got sat between Wayne Gretzky, who's probably the greatest ever, and Gordy Howe, the two greats. And Gordy Howe was a, a cut up, and he gave me a hot foot, and he was playing jokes on me the whole time. And Gretzky uh, says, "You're a DJ, right?" Uh, yeah. And he goes, uh, "Here's my." He was dating a girl uh, who was the Anne Marie uh, of Canada, or I guess Anne Marie from Canada too. Just you know, not my kind of music at all, not rock music. He goes, "This is my girlfriend. Uh, will you play this record?" And I'm like, you know, it's the great one. So I go, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, man. And he gave me an old four, uh, 45 with, uh, with the, the big, hole in the middle. punch out in yeah. the middle. So I, I never played it. And I'm, I'm on uh, the, my show, my morning show one day, and I get a call in the hotline. It's Gretzky. <laughs> and he goes, what man, you never. This? <laughs> this is like, uh, oh, my gosh, probably 86, maybe. Mm -hmm. And he goes, uh, man, you never played the record. That's my girlfriend's record. You got to play the record. And I go, oh, Christ. All right. So I played the record, and my boss calls me up, and he goes, take that off now, <laughs> or you're fired. Yeah, because like the, hotline, goes, the, great one. He the goes, hotline would ring like in the middle of the record, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. That's a danger phone. Yeah, yeah when that, that phone rings, a, it's never good news. Not a good, not, yeah. Never good. Yeah. No. I mean, literally a hotline, right? Yeah, never good. Did Let's you take Gretzky. it off? Yeah, I did. I but I, that's what I tried to say. I go, it's Gretzky, and he goes, I don't give a shit. Take it off. <sighs> that was uh, KLOS. Or yeah, KLOS, KLOS. Uh, I had those kind of things happen. Um, one time we used to do a spoof, and maybe you guys did this too. Of uh, we started at K Rock um, of the Rose Parade. We would go on and make fun of the Rose Parade. We would tell people to look at Channel Five, turn down the sound, and we would you know do a play by play. 
And we did a couple things like that. We called we called a Super Bowl game, which was really a, a mess. And we also called a, a heavyweight boxing uh, match uh, with Leon Spinks and, and Ali. But um, anyway, we we did the Rose Parade, and uh, this was on KMET. And I get a call. It's the program director. And he goes, "You're fired." We're halfway into the parade. He goes, this sucks. He goes, you're fired. So we're in the, we go into the conference room, and we're sitting there like, okay, what do we do now? Uh, they, all of a sudden, this guy comes, uh, calls up again, and he goes, get back in there and finish it up. The guy's wife loved it and thought it was great. <laughs> so we were hired again like a half an hour later. Jesus Christ. That's all it takes. Thank God for her. <laughs> well, we have, a, um, we have a bit. That we do that's not exactly simulcasting the Rose Parade, but uh, you'd be pretty good at this, Frazier, so I think you should uh, play along with us. It's called uh, Hollywood Hand-Me-Downs, and this is famous stuff, memorabilia, like Hollywood memorabilia that's going up for auction. Oh, okay. And sold at auction, and we got to guess what it got. We have All an right. intro? It's time to find out how much did they pay in another round of Hollywood hand-me-downs. All of these items are from a recent recent heritage auction, the Commissar Collection Platinum Signature, uh, held uh, the 2nd through the 4th this month, just recently in Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. First up, the iconic bright red Lycra swimsuit worn by Pamela Anderson in her role as heartthrob lifeguard C.J. Parker on Mm. Baywatch. Uh, let's see. Soiled or clean? Because uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a that different. Matters. That makes a difference. There's a different category. Yeah. Uh, and then the question with all this stuff is, how many did they do? You know, was this the hero one? Because they have backups. Sure. Of, this of might everything. not be the OG. <laughs> right. But I, it would definitely be one of them that she wore. It came that. with a picture of her wearing this swimsuit, so it was worn. It's probably uh, one of many, but yeah. yes, it was worn on TV. Yeah. Mm. All right. Okay. Well, uh, the, you want to go first? Recent doc with her in it. Uh, this memorabilia stuff's going up a lot lately. Uh, there's certainly a lot, a lot of weirdos out there. A lot of weirdos pay. out there who would definitely sniff that thing Mm -hmm. sure and uh i don't know i think we should all write down a number because otherwise everyone's number is going to go off of come on max pat i gotta we gotta write them down man otherwise they're just going to go off of what the first guy says okay all right all right you guys got it yep yeah i went 80k jeez 75 wow I went a lot lower. I went 13K, because I think there's a lot of these out there. Okay. The swimsuit was sold for $30,000. Okay. Oh, Loxamon is the closest. All right. Okay. Up next, a large large custom-designed wooden desk that was used by Jay Leno at home base during his formative 1990s episodes. So this is from The Tonight Show. Jay Leno's desk. His desk from The Tonight Show. That looks huge. Yes. Yeah. Wow. This is pretty big. He's got The Tonight Show set, basically, in his warehouse. At his warehouse, right? Yeah. yeah. You watch yeah. movies there. Watch. Uh, so is this not the hero set. desk? That's the question. I think it's the hero it desk. Like hero it's desk. it's yeah, in his one. early years. So the the when when the show came around in the 1990s in the early 90s I guess. Hmm. I wonder how long the run was for this desk. That's what they should tell you. It doesn't say that, but it just say that over 22 seasons oh, yes. and uh, 4610 episodes, but it doesn't say how many were no, on this it was, desk. It was Carson's desk. Mm. That's a little different. Yeah. yeah. They should they usually, when they're trying to sell stuff like this, they supply a picture which has, you know, him and Phyllis Diller or something <laughs> yeah. leaning against <laughs> it or something. We need some I need extra. something for scale, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, again, I mean, we don't know if they this thing made it one season or ten seasons. You, you got to research this stuff, uh, Ben, because uh, otherwise it's kind of hard to tell. But you guys want to lock it in? 22 seasons, yeah. right? I got well. He did twenty-two seasons. Oh, yeah. Uh, let me. Yeah, it doesn't me, say how many were on this desk. Let me explain wording to everybody. 
You know, when they're like trying to sell a car, they'll go, uh, you know, this car was a Porsche race car. Porsche dominated Le Mans for over two decades. And you go, well, there we go. But not that car. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So they, they do that sometimes. All right. So there's, Got me. there's Piven back when he had less hair. There's Piven leaning against the desk mm -hmm. during the 90s. All right. It, it made That's it on take camera. But we don't know. Uh -huh. uh, we don't know how long it was used. All right, let's just say, I say iconic. Jay's uh, still alive, so it'll be worth less unless he tries to fire up another steam car. <laughs> so, Jesus. I don't know. I'm going back with Pam Anderson and just going 80K. I said 50. Mm -hmm. yeah, this desk, if it was just sold at like an office depot, it's probably $800. Mm -hmm. So it, it's pretty nice. It's solid wood. It looks like, um, but I, I went double Pam Anderson's swimsuit, 60K. Mm -hmm. The desk was sold for $45,000. Oh. Fraser Smith is the closest. Nice. All right. Next All right. up, a pair of bullet deflecting metal cuffs that were worn by Linda Carter during season <laughs> one of Wonder Woman. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Now we're talking. Also will be smelled. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 More sniffing. Um, she's still alive, still looking hot. Love these. She went from these to the brass cuffs or something later on, or mind like making making that up. But she was uh, quite the cutie back in the day. All right, what does this go for? And tell me what you guys think of this. As long as we're talking about seventies uh, TV and what your take is now in Bewitched. They replaced the first Darren with this another dude who was just Darren. Not and Dick York, right? There's Dick York and Dick Sargent. Oh, right. Okay. They just went with a new one. Right. And then in the Partridge family, they got rid of the, the drummer kid, and they just went with the new blonde kid. But there's this, they just called him Chris. Yeah, no questions asked. Just... They just would replace people and just give them the same name. Yeah. Now, because in Bewitch, she couldn't have gotten divorced, and they didn't want to kill him off, and they just went, here's your new Darren. It's a different yeah. dude, but you know it's TV. It's a buy, and I and I and I get it for like the Partridge Family because you get one season with the dude, and then they swap him out. And they just go with a new dude. Get over it. But I'm watching the Love Boat the other day. They got the new cruise director in there because this is like 1986 or something. Right. She's a blonde, and her name is Julie McCoy. They did nine seasons of the other. They didn't do one season, and yeah. she was playing the fucking triangle in the back of the band. This is <laughs> nine, and we can look it up. Ben can look it up. But this is nine seasons of Julie McCoy. There's only one Julie McCoy. And then they replace her. It's like, hey, Julie. So weird. No, hey, that's... Captain Stewie. It's like, just say Julie got married. She's living in Toronto, you know? Yeah, and then it's an we easy got... switch. Yeah, we got do that. Yeah, yeah, we got Cindy Jennings coming in. She's a new cruise director. They just gave her the same name. After <laughs> and, and is it just a? Are they doing it as a fuck you to the old actress? Like, is it uh, fuck off? I wonder. Like you, yeah. you fucking wanted to uh, negotiate with your contract. <laughs> you got greedy. Fuck you. We'll we bring another blonde in, and we'll just give her your name. I think it's that and. I think new characters being introduced into shows are never well received. But then, but then, what? Okay, but but if you're an actor on the set, like if you're Doctor Bricker or Isaac or Gopher, and you've been on the show for nine seasons now, don't you raise your hand and go, "It's weird, just calling her Julie." Yeah, and then <laughs> oh, there's sort of references to the past, like, "Hey, Julie, remember eight years ago in Mazatlan, and we had we tied one on, like, but that wasn't her." Well, and they're like, also thinking, "I better." Be careful with my negotiations. There'll be a new Isaac in here. Isaac's going to be just a red-haired guy, <laughs> yeah. pouring drinks. Growing up, I've seen it done also with women. Uh, Fresh Prince, they changed the the aunt uh, a few seasons in. And same with Family Matters. The mom was changed. The, the, the same, seven, same character, different actress. Yeah, Lauren uh, Tours was Julie McCoy for seven seasons. And then Patricia Klaus comes in and just they just call her Julie McCoy. That's I, 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 it's definitely weird for the actors. It's weird. It's weird. It's got to be weird. It's weird for everybody. For everybody. Just, <laughs> just yeah. fucking give her a new name. Are you saying there's zero turnover on cruise ships? 
I don't <laughs> buy on. it. I bet that's a huge turnover industry. I bet more. Sure. I'm, I'm surprised one of the cast members hasn't just fallen off the yeah. fucking boat <laughs> these they days. You know what I mean? Long. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just she was young and now she fell in love with a doctor and got married and then moved to Portland. Yeah. It's lazy writing. Yeah, I, I I don't know how this stuff works, but all right. Or maybe they had uh, too many lunch pails made up with her name on it or, or something. That could I, be. I don't know. All right, Wonder Woman. <laughs> Fucking Julie McCoy. Um, yeah. What? A, all right, I don't know. The people, the, but the comic book shit is big now, and mm. and all that, and gal gadot or gadot or whatever she saw. So maybe there's something here. I I got no. I I got no. Thoughts on this one? Well, this isn't a swimsuit, right? These are right. just something she wore on her wrist. She yeah. did sweat in them. Um, yeah. They deflected bullets. Uh, they're smaller. So I went. So she had brass cuffs in later episodes. Uh, That's what I so remember. Yeah, so All right. These, these are, are early, early, early yeah. old school. Uh, these are from season one. Oh, season one. Eight grand. I went a little higher. I went 10 grand each. each. 20 grand. Whoa. I had uh, 30 for the pair. Mm. The pair was sold for $32,500. Wow. That's a lot Very of good. coin for some bracelets. Maybe it well, is they do, season one They thing do too. deflect Maybe. bullets. And yeah. They, oh yeah. Go try yeah. it out. Yeah. Go down to Watts and give it a shot. Next up, the signature dress worn by Agnes Moorhead as Endora. Now we're oh, now we're the talking. The two Darrens. Apparently, she wore this dress throughout the entire series. Uh huh. Um, how much? Oh boy. Hmm. Agnes Moorhead, Endora. It's kind of weird. I just brought up Bewitched too before this. Yeah, you did. Yeah. yeah. Lots of quinky. If the next well, thing yeah, is Roger Miller's stuff. guitar, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> or if it's Julie McCoy's <laughs> uh, kerchief. Uh, this song, uh, this I feel like this show's making a comeback it's on every rotation on, on the, the cable stations these days. <laughs> Find myself watching it just to get a weird little glimpse into like what we thought was funny and what what everything was back in the day. But Agnes Moorhead, now who was, you know, these 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 actresses would be the stars of Broadway and Sirens when they were, you know, 20s and 30s, and then they just wrote out their career, their right. 50s and 60s, in shitty sitcoms. Right, but think yeah. of all the Agnes Moorhead fans. I mean, a lot of them who are really hardcore are probably dead. So yeah. who's really buying a- this AIDS now? AIDS got them in the, in the 80s for <laughs> sure. Probably. If you're yeah. a big Agnes Moorhead fan, you are claimed by AIDS. There's there's no doubt about that. Speaking, yeah, yeah, that ain't... Well, I was in a dune buggy accident or going or riding the Baja 500. You think that's Darren in the cage there? Is it, She's turned him into a crow? Yeah, probably. <laughs> There was a lot of blinking him into stuff, and yeah. then and then and then and then Samantha yelling at her to undo whatever yeah, it is she yeah. did to to Darren. Um, all right, Bill, who the hell on this one? But but she wore it every single time. That's the yeah. That's the only thing that really I think makes it meaningful. I mm. mean, yeah, I don't. Not a sniffing item per not se. A sniffing not item. really, but you never know. I don't see a big demand for something like this, even though it is getting more rotation on the cable channels. Mm. So I went a little more exact just because Frazier's getting pretty close to all these. So mm-hmm. I went I went fourteen five, fourteen thousand five hundred dollars I went thirteen k. I I went twenty five. Mm-hmm. Sold for eighteen thousand seven hundred fifty. Chris is the closest. Jesus. All right, Chris. I'm getting locked out here, man. <laughs> yep, we got Chris and Fraser tied up at two apiece. Look at us. All right. How about that? Do have, how many more do we have? Two more. All right. This ornate glass bottle provided the home for Barbara Eden's beloved genie. Mm. It's the lamp. Oh, well, that's Through the funny. first season of I Dream of Genie. And it's actually a Jim Beam Christmas decanter <laughs> that one of the producers received as a Christmas present. Uh, he repainted it. And they used it on the set. That hurts the value, I think, to tell people that. Or helps. Oh, my God. My fragile young mind was so scrambled sexually and beyond by these sitcoms because you had Barbara Eden, who was like the hottest ever. Hottest ever. Hottest ever. And she lived in this bottle. 
and they do interiors of the bottle, mm. bigger bottle, obviously for the interior shoots. Sure? But they, she had this crushed velvet, like round it's a lounge, lounge that she would live in and she'd just be sitting around going like how can i please my master like i have to please him like i need to please my master like she was sitting around screaming about pleasing her master constantly and in a smoke show then i'd switch channels and i'd go over to bewitch and it was another elizabeth montgomery was a Equally as She's hot. She's pretty hot, too. Was like yeah. sit, like, in frantic, like, oh, my God, I have to have dinner ready for Darren when he comes home. I can't be I can't be late. Like, how do I please Darren? So all this smoke show wanted to do was please her man, and then the other one wanted to please her master. And that was it. And then my mom didn't even shave her armpits. She was just flopped out on a, <laughs> yeah. on, was on a mattress on the floor it's in the real. next room yelling yeah. freak out with the door shut. And I was like... What is going on? Which? <laughs> yeah. Why not a little bit of this? Yeah, where's some of that? How, some how about whiplash. some of that? What happened to that? What happened to that? And you, where is that? Did Come these on. shows ruin your expectations of women then? I think they ruined I, everybody. Yeah, every, every, everything, every one of these shows, every goddamn commercial where the woman is like, she's standing over the washing machine and she's having a, a meltdown because there's ring around the collar. Mm-hmm. The guy had a dress shirt evidently sweats a lot or something was outdoors or something and there's that dirty ring yeah. around the collar get it. and she's like coming undone because she can't get the ring around the collar so eh, there was end dust the house was never clean enough the food was never good enough nothing was fresh enough the collar was too dirty and the, and the women were like oh my god what am i i'm i have to sit around and really just think about ways to get this collar clean Smash cut to me entering the world. Oh my God, I never, I, I had no idea. There was none of this. <laughs> yeah, Zero. Yeah. I mean, but just imagine going to a woman and going, hey, lady, hello, <laughs> collar, yeah, ring. Try, try that now. Fucking no. take care of it, <laughs> bitch. Come on now. And I'm hungry, by the way. Why isn't that ice bucket filled with ice? I come home. I've been home for 10 minutes now from work. Where's my, where's my highball? Especially with everyone's home security cameras. They'll put uh, that up. Uh, no. We've the, lost good old days, yeah. the good old days, guys. The good old days. Much, much better time. Yeah. Much I better come home, time. I'm told I'm, I look like a slob. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's a, that ring around your collar. Imagine <laughs> what it is. You know, uh, imagine just <laughs> this. Imagine, imagine just this in this modern age. Imagine just walking in to your home from work and just sitting down at the dinner table. Just like, I'm walking in. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to sit here. And there better be a fucking martini showing up. Yeah, where's my drink? And some meatloaf, like now. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm home. Like, if, if I ever did that and just sat there, I'd, I'd just be sitting there. I'd just sit there for the end of eternity. You'd still be there now. Some, yeah, I'd yeah. be sit there, and people, at some point, people go like, when is he leaving? Or what's he, do, what's he doing? I mean, you didn't have to ask where dinner was or where your martini was. You were home from work. It's on the way. And you just go sit at the table. Yeah. It's going to show up. <laughs> Oh, my God. Those are the days. Oh, my God. All right, the bottle. This bottle. The bottle. Bottles. I mean, it's iconic. Jesus. I don't know. Okay. All right, we got it? Mm, yeah. I Look, this is a, this is a different pe- uh, piece of memorabilia compared to, like, the clothes. Because you can, you can put this out all the time. Have it on display. You could do something. It's like the Stanley Cup. You could drink mm. your milk out of it if you want. You could do yeah. whatever. Put your grandfather's ashes into it. Oh, yeah. So You probably like that. Very yeah. useful, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I went 44K. Wow, interesting. I went 22, exactly half. Well, I think it's cooler than uh, Jay Leno's desk, so I'm going with 51. <whistles> Genie's bottle sold for $50,000. Mm, Another point for Fraser. Ooh. Wow. He's good. Razor's on yeah, no. fire. And lastly, I knew he'd excel at this game. <laughs> just better than Jay's desk. That's how I look that's, at it. Yeah, that's weird. Oh, is that more than Jay's desk? Yeah, Jay's desk. Is- oh, man. Poor Jay. I'm going to tell Jay. <laughs> I hope Jay. <laughs> tell Jay I'm not going to tell Jay. I'm going to get Barbara Eden to come with me to Jay's <laughs> wow. shop. Is she still, she's still alive, yeah, right? I think so, yeah. She's probably in town. I, well, let's look. Back. I could yeah. pull that off. <laughs> I, I I don't have a ton of juice. 
But I think I, I I think I could get Barbara Eden to come with me to Jay Leno's shop and explain to him that her miniature bottle that started off life as a Jim Beam decorative <laughs> bottle is more valuable than his bespoke and beloved yeah. desk. You're going to knock that would crush on Jay's Jay. door. Yeah. yeah. Hey, yeah. I know you just got your face almost burned off and, and I got will. close I would do it. And now your desk means nothing. Yeah, by the way. Yeah. She's 91 years young. We could do huh. it. She in Los Angeles? I, I, I could pull this off. We could <laughs> do, do it. Let's do it. Yeah, Let's you do have it. to pick her up. But yeah. All right. We can do it. Mm-hmm. Our last auction items are the iconic costumes of Batman, the Caped Crusader, and Robin, the Boy Wonder, that were worn by Adam West and Burt Ward. These crime-fighting uniforms from the classic 66 series are some of the most iconic costumes from any era or genre of television. Remember when, oh, okay. remember when Jay Ward was making the rounds, like in the 90s? Like, there's these weird little things, kind of like, the Brady kids came. There was weird things where in the nineties and and beyond, like when a sitcom or has been gone for like twenty two years or something. At some point, somebody writes a book or something, and you know you got uh, Marianne from Gilligan's Island. So it starts showing up on shit in the nineties, like it was popping up. And I think Jay Ward was that, or uh, Bert uh, Bert Ward. Bert Ward, Ward starts showing up. But now here's an interesting thing. And I remember, I think, Ben, you can look this up. I have a, I have a recollection. I think I was at K-Rock in the 90s when Kevin and Bean, and he was like showing up. I think one of the things he was talking about in his book was having so much junk that they had to like modify the shorts he was wearing. Like it just, uh, they're kind of a, yeah, you know, they're a little Speedo-esque. And, uh, I think what his thing was is they're like, or somebody started a thing where it's like, you know, they had to modify the the thing. Um, notice when guys ever get the reputation of having uh, too big a hog, they never set the record straight. They, they'll, oh, yeah. they'll laugh it off. <laughs> they'll be like, oh, why yeah, would you? Yeah. That's my whole thing. No yeah. guys ever went. That's a rumor. Yeah. Very medium sized cock. Yeah. Very me- medium to small. Yeah. Someone say, ask my ask ex wife. Really nothing there. They never correct the record. They just like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, never you, know, you know, people will talk. Or, I can't, uh, I'm not going to confirm or deny <laughs> that. And you say anyone has a big dick and they never fucking, they'll never walk it back. They'll never correct the and record. Why would you really? Uh, that's my point. Yeah. But all right, let's see. As revealed that in the studio asked him, I did a personal appearance with to both take these penis guys. shrinking pills. I this can't. Is this in the book? Penis the, shrinking pills. Hey, what is the source? You they're know, not, all they, you got to do is uh, they're not paying me enough. Just tell Agnes Moorhead to take the dress off. There you go. And that's when the penis. Who needs a pill? <laughs> shrink. But what are penis? Of a salt <laughs> Peter? What is a? I'd penis buy that shrink? bottle and just walk around with it. I just leave it on the dash of my car. You know what I mean? Oh, this old thing. Yeah. Oh, I'm out. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think I got a case in the trunk. Let me see if that's a hey, sweetheart. Just have a seat in the van. Let me see if I can get my penis shrinking pills out. It's hard to drive with the, you know, regular sized penis. ABC told Batman actor Burt Ward to take what? pills to shrink. Uh, this is not a thing. This no, isn't that a can't be. Did Burt Ward start this rumor? <laughs> He would first off Turkey <laughs> towels in his other shorts. The studio, uh, huh. the studio's gonna look. The studio's gonna walk into talent and go, "Hey, look, uh, penis too big, too prodigious." Uh, Bob, bring those penis shrinking pills in here. <laughs> see if, yeah. Is that, the, is that right. the batarang? <laughs> <laughs> take it with that. Just take it with a meal. Yeah. Uh, but, all right, you would go to wardrobe. And you would tell them to pad it out a little bit or to mm-hmm. do to do something, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is according to Ward himself. Well, of course. Right. Bert, Bert Ward yeah. said that the studio had. <laughs> <Right>. Heads up, <laughs> citizen. Penis shrink. <laughs> By the way, if there was a thing called, if there was a pill that shrunk your penis, do you know how many of my jack-off buddies would put it in my soda <laughs> and put it in my beer just to <laughs> fuck with me? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy put shaving cream in my toothpaste thing once. Like he took the toothpaste out and rammed tooth, 
shaving cream in there. So I would brush my teeth with, with shaving cream. If there were actual penis shrinking pills, oh. he would have them. You'd be and he'd be feeding them to everybody. Yeah. It'd be crushed up and everyone's soup and omelet, you know. All right, anyway. His penis was too big. All right. The, these are iconic. And Batman is huge. And this is yeah. two outfits now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, both. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. This is going to be a big one. Yeah, Batman's so, still huge. This still a big making number. movies. Oh, yeah. Right. All right. So, yeah, multi-generational here. Now, the way this game works is even though you guys have been dominating, whoever gets closest in this one wins. <laughs> oh, now wait. Yeah, All right. that's how it works. Rules are rules. Uh, right. pff, boy. Jeez, I don't know. All right, you guys in? Yeah. Yep. 225. I I mean, I haven't seen anything past the 100K mark yet, so I went, I went 120. And I am going uh, 400,000. Mm. Jeez. Oh, we definitely have a winner. Both costumes were sold at auction for $615,000, oh, Fraser Smith. With wow, I knew it. Wow. Cancel my penis <laughs> shrinking <laughs> face. That was Hollywood hand-me-downs. <laughs> nice job, Fraser. Wow. That was killer. I'm an old guy. That's how I knew. That's impressive, man. Penis shrinking pills. All <laughs> right. We'll uh, take ourselves a quick break. Got some news and some other stuff to follow up on, and we'll do that with Fraser Smith right after this. Let me tell you about Angie Homeowners. You know, it's a lot of work to own a home, whether it's uh, everyday maintenance, repairs, or dream projects. It can be hard to even know where to start. All you need is Angie. You're home for everything home. Find a skilled local pro who will deliver quality and experience. Over 20 years of home service experience. Bring them your project online or with the Angie app. Answer a few questions and Angie handles the rest. Look, you're busy. You don't have time to do all this stuff. Let Angie handle it. Take care of just about any home project in just a few taps. Download the free Angie mobile app today. Or visit online. Visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com. A-N-G-I dot com. That's Angie. Let them do all the heavy lifting. The Jordan Harbinger Show, a different kind of sponsor for this episode. The Jordan Harbinger Show. Well, if you're a fan of fascinating podcasts and interesting people, you should definitely check this one out. There's an episode for everyone, no matter what you're into. Jordan talks with Scott Adams about persuasion in a world where facts don't matter anymore. Man, is he right? Or you go inside the dark world of wildlife trafficking. You'll always find something useful to apply to your own life, like routine changes to boost productivity or slight mindset tweaks to change how you see the world. Jordan's a good guy. We've had him on uh, many times. I know the man well, and he's worth a listen. We enjoy the show, and we know you will too. So you can search The Jordan Harbinger Show. That is H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. I was just in a first-class lounge. I made my way into a, a lounge. Congrats, by the way. Yeah. yeah, with a three-hour layover in Atlanta, and I've made it. I've, tell me what you guys think. And I, I think this is a this is a thing. Um, all the first class lounges I've ever been in have a soup offering, but the soup offering is always a weirdo soup <laughs> offering. It's you know Thai lemon lemons lemon Thai with bitter herbs. You know, like some weird like a Tom Yum. Yeah, it's not. It's what I'm, what I'm saying is, is you go, you know, beef and barley, and everyone's in. Mm -hmm. Sure, you go chicken soup, everyone's in. You go matzo ball with like chicken, everyone's in. But they don't want to have to refill that bucket that often. <laughs> and they get, and it's highfalutin. They get some. They get a few points for being cool. Sure, but it's always a weird <laughs> offering. It's like a you know, it's it's like a, you know, it's it's a tomato bisque or something but there's no meat in it and then there's like a thai spicy something and you just kind of look at it and go eh, i don't know like I, I think i'll pass if whatever whatever their offering was if it was 
chock full of vegetables. and cho- if, if it was like the top three of the Hungry Man soup offerings, like a noodle, like a chicken noodle or something like that, they'd be walking back and forth, replacing Fresh it, shit. Fill, yeah. refilling it all Absolutely. the time. They go with shit. Like they, they must go... What are the two soups America can't stand, <laughs> but that sound okay? Like, we, we can't have gopher head soup. Gotta like, find you know. a balance, yeah. People line up for that, though. They have shit soup, and then they don't have to fucking deal with you. That's I think it's, my I think it's a good take. Yeah, because soup yeah. takes the longest to make. Yeah. Right? So you yeah, have you just to reheat it the next day. Yeah. I just It just struck me the periodical times where I'm in a first class lounge. Always see the ladle hanging out, little. Always a little anticipation. Ooh, what have we here? You know, <laughs> like if they had chili, they'd have to oh, constantly redo it. it. Yeah. If you did fucking chili with grated cheese and onion chopped up and stuff, they, you'd, you'd be walking back and forth. They'd be filling it every every ten seconds. Yeah. So they go with weird spicy Thai <laughs> lemon soup, and no one wants any of that shit. Yeah. No. They probably even work it out regionally. Like they go, this is Atlanta. Almost no Thai population, and people aren't very exotic in these parts. So it's definitely yeah. Thai, then, right? <laughs> yeah, like we're not we're not going with a chicken and barley or gumbo mm-hmm. or something that that's going to be consumed. I think so. Too much. No. You yeah. know, we'll go with something shitty purpose. that no one wants. That's all right. Yeah. We're on to you. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. Um, all right, let's see what else did I want to uh, get into. You, you, Chris, chronicled the distance that the merch bag yeah and yesterday's podcast you were trying to compare the distance uh traveled between the merch bag which you took on your odyssey just to get to a comedy club at the end of your like five day trip um <laughs> the, the, yeah he, adam took his merch he was performing at a comedy club on this trip where he went to new york nashville and then to alabama and but he only needed the merch no, bag. i went to new york florida florida right uh, Nashville, and then Alabama. But he only needed the merch bag in Alabama. But he still took this sixty-one pound bag, all the heaviest way, shit, all biggest the, all shit. Them. Yeah, throwing it in and out of Ubers, the biggest. Not room in some of the Ubers. Had to throw shit in like the back seat. And it's stuff. a big bag, and all, right. all comics deal with that, right? You but know. but then but Adam had the thought: What if we just shipped this bag? What if we had just shipped it from L.A. To Alabama, and then he wouldn't have to drag it around, pay the the overweight luggage fees at all the airlines and things like that. Yeah, to be fair, August drags it around, Mike August, but it is burdensome. And <laughs> I just feel bad, like he's muling this thing through every airport. And then you have to wait for it at the carousel while he's out getting the rental car. I got to wait at the carousel. Oh, no, by you got to get way, to the airport earlier because you have to check it in. You have to get in. there earlier to yeah. fucking check the bag. It's a, it's a shit show. So, yeah, I said. And by, by the way, we, we took it to Alabama, sold three books and two T-shirts and well, made saying, 80 the bucks and go? came home. I, I just, you know, we sold 100 <laughs> bucks worth of merch. And, <laughs> But I mean, we, we we have fourteen hours of dragging this thing at minimum yeah. wage. It's we mainly, didn't get paid it's mainly enough. Hardcover books in there. We <laughs> got to ship it. Uh, yeah. How much? So I said to Mike, "Ship it next time. Just ship it." He's yeah. like, "Are you kidding me? You know how expensive it'd be to ship." But this thing was dragged all over New York City. It was stowed in restaurants. It was oh. it was stowed at front desks. Every uh, yeah. right. how much to ship it? Slow boat to Huntsville from here. Had you have shipped it. It would have shipped. Uh, the slowest you can go is ground shipping. It would have if you shipped it today, which is Monday. You they would have gotten it on Friday. Mm-hmm. One hundred fifty six dollars. Well, Mike Dry said one hundred fifty bucks. Yeah. All right. But in which case, I would have said, then fuck it, don't bring a merch bag. Yeah, there you go. But well, I think anyway. it's worth paying it. Yeah, you could pay it, ship it there, do it right, and walk out next to a hundred bucks in your pocket or yeah. something, something like that. But anyway, goddamn, this albatross we you dragged this yeah, that's everywhere. Rough. Don't you know how many miles it traveled? Yeah, it. I want to know how many miles it traveled because here to Phoenix, Phoenix to Newark or LaGuardia or where the fuck we were. Newark. 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 All right, yeah. yeah, and then the so down to Jacksonville. Jacksonville yeah, I, I, I want to know. They ought to offer know. you merch miles. Okay. Did you? Did you? <laughs> merch miles, yes. Did you figure out how far? It wasn't just from New York to Jacksonville. It's from the Jacksonville airport to the resort we went to, which is like another 36 miles. Well, yeah, this is and back a again. Couple, a couple dozen miles. But the. the, um, the oh, so you just went Jacksonville. I went from LAX to Phoenix, Phoenix to Newark, 
Newark to JFK, JFK mm. to Jacksonville, Jacksonville to Nashville. All right, but to be fair, you got to tack on 75 miles because it went from Jacksonville to the golf resort that was 30 five miles away sure. and then turned around the next morning and went back to Jacksonville. And even in New York, it went from the airport to Dr. Drew's place. I have that. Oh, you do? Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, sorry. No, I have that. And then from the Dr. Drew's season. place to the steak joint, me and Mike. Right. That's why I said you take a couple to... dozen miles just based I'd on I'd say you, you got to – and then, yeah, so then Nashville it went from the airport. No, we – shit. Yeah, it went from – no, it went from South Carolina. Yeah. Okay, well, you did, tell well, me. Let's start off. I'm with, saying you'd tack 150 to 200 miles <laughs> onto okay. this number. We can do that after. But uh, let, let's start with your Indian food. So Adam got Indian food in the Hamptons, mm-hmm. and he um, he got it. He had some leftover, so he put it in the doggy bag, and then he took it home. He f- basically took it back to his place in New York, flew it home to LAX, drove it up to Malibu, where he then consumed it. <laughs> Afterwards, it's a long way to go with the doggy bag. Yeah, yeah. Hamptons to yeah. Malibu, basically. Yeah, yeah. That traveled about twenty six hundred miles. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So the merch bag, this merch bag, and I just went. First off, let's just take it all the way to how did how long did it take to get to the comedy club in Huntsville, Alabama? Hmm. Oh, that was. Uh, yeah, I mean, from 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 Nashville to Huntsville was one hundred and ten miles or twenty miles right. or something. 4,242 miles. 4,000. That's how much it traveled from LAX to Alabama with right. all, the, all the detours that you had to take. And then there's home. Because right. home. Home adds another uh, 2,000, so it's about 6,267 miles. <laughs> so what's the grand total? 6,267 miles. This merch bag has With an 80 pound. Wow. It needs merch miles. If you merch, <laughs> merch miles. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, the humanity! Yeah, dragging yeah, that's that thing a lot. everywhere. That's a drag. <laughs> Literally, yeah. sixty-two pounds. It's wow! A it's a tra- oh. Traveling merch bag. Yeah, well, I had stories to tell. Yeah, God love Mike. He is a mule. He'll do anything for a nickel. Poor Mike. On that but one, he didn't yeah. think this one out. Nobody <laughs> thought this one out. I was just like merch bag. I didn't think it was all the way at the end of the trip. Yeah, should have. Oh, okay. Right. Some comics say they make more selling their merch than they do than what they get paid for the week. Yeah, we spent more on diesel fuel <laughs> and jet a mu- muling this shit around <laughs> six thousand miles plus, and this is light because we're just going airport to airport. We forget from right. the airport to the hotel to the venue. To the, oh god damn, that's uh, we got to figure out a new way. We got to figure out a new way. Well, yeah. the thing. So now you know we're at Huntsville. How the gigs go? Oh, it was a great gig. It was sold out. Big room, crazy crowd, a great crowd. It was, it was a great show. So I, I did a, a two thirty in the afternoon show in Huntsville, and it was kick ass. I mean, and Huntsville has the most PhDs like per capita in the United States because it's all NASA stuff oh, going right, on right. over oh, there. All right, okay. But so now you got to smash cut to the show's over. And Mike and I are getting ready to pack it up, head from Huntsville to the airport in Huntsville with the merch bag again, and then go from the Huntsville airport to Atlanta, and then lay over in Atlanta for three hours, and then go end up at LA. I ended up at LAX at about twelve forty-five at night, waiting by the carousel for the for the merch bag while Mike was out trying to figure out a an Uber or whatever twelve. 45 that night but um we're on stage at at huntsville and the show's over it's it's four in the afternoon we got to be wheels up at 4 30 heading to the airport mike's on stage got the table set up it's got the merch bag set up it's got a couple books up there and some some t-shirts and then i'm standing there signing taking pictures with everybody but now I'm obsessed with the merch bag and the weight, right? So I'm staying on stage. Everything must go. And and Mike's going, uh, like literally Mike's like, we, uh, I don't know if we have small, we have, ex- no, I think we have a small <laughs> and we have a medium. I don't know if we have an extra model. And I'm like, don't sell the t-shirts, Mike. Move those books. 
<laughs> Buy a book. <laughs> those That's books the are heavy. The, the, <laughs> this, this merch bag is breaking our ass because of these books. The books. That are in there. And so everyone's like coming up, looking at T-shirts. And I'm like, stop looking at T-shirts. You look at some books. <laughs> Half off like, on the books. We already have books. We already have the books. Then oh, get geez. another book. Sell those books, Mike. And I'm yelling at everyone to buy the books to no avail. Wow. Refilled the merch bag. Headed headed oh, to Huntsville. Never airport. easy. Well, they have so many PhDs there. I mean, they're all well read. They don't yeah. need the books. Anymore. Yeah, there are. They probably have them or yeah. God they knows could use whatever. A t-shirt, but though. that that was the odyssey that was uh, the merch pack. Wow. Does it throw you off that people of that uh, of people are that smart, of that intelligence listen to you? Mm. Or like you know, or like, are there any people that surprise you? Like, why are you listening to what I'm saying? Well, once I remember when I was doing radio, when I was doing morning radio. There were like the uh, the program director said, um, you're number one in Vegas. And I said, good. And then he said, per capita, it's the dumbest people in the United <laughs> States. And I said, fine. You never want to hear yeah. that. Yeah. But then he said, you're also number one in Seattle. Per capita, the smartest people cool. in the country. And I was like, good. Then we're covered. So you covered that, everything. That's all, all, the I, that's yeah. all I cared yeah. about. Yeah. Hey, Vegas, you dummies. Adam's going to be that's there right. uh, July 20th. <laughs> you shit kickers. I'm coming to your podunk town. Yeah. <laughs> that's coming up, right? That's coming up oh, this, this Thursday, yeah, July this 20th, Thursday. Yeah. August 10th. Yeah, he'll be there every month. <clears throat> oh, sweet. There you are. Yeah. All right. Let's take a break and we'll come back and do some news after this. The professional parts people at O'Reilly Auto Parts are in the business of keeping your car on the road. They offer friendly, helpful service and the parts knowledge you need for your maintenance and repairs. The team at O'Reilly Auto Parts can test your battery for free in or out of the car. If it needs to be replaced, they'll help you find the right battery for your vehicle. If your check engine light is on, O'Reilly Auto Parts will scan it and retrieve your trouble codes for free. If needed, they'll even refer you to a repair shop. When you're a do-it-yourselfer and need a specialty tool to finish the job, stop by O'Reilly Auto Parts and ask about their loaner tool program. Simply pay a refundable deposit and borrow the right tool. Then get your deposit back when it's returned. Ready for some new wiper blades? The professional parts people at O'Reilly Auto Parts will help you pick out just what you need for your car and will even install them for you for free. O'Reilly Auto Parts has thousands of quality parts and accessories in stock that you might need to keep your vehicle running at its best. Place your order online at O'Reilly Auto Parts and then pick it up at your local store. You can even have your order shipped directly to your doorstep, giving you the freedom of shopping on your schedule. Stop by O'Reilly Auto Parts today or visit O'ReillyAuto.com. Let me tell you about Turo Innovative. It's the world's largest car sharing marketplace with Turo. You can book any car you want, wherever you want, from a community of local hosts. Browse a huge selection of vehicles for just about any occasion or budget. Book an SUV or a minivan for a family road trip, a pickup truck for some errands, or even test drive an EV. Every trip is backed by liability insurance. Terms, conditions, and exclusions apply. Find your drive. Forget your boring rental cars at Taro. T-U-R-O dot com. Viator experiences are what people love most about travel. I mean, God, taking my son fishing in Alaska. That was so amazing. I'll never forget it. Viator, it's a website and app for booking travel experiences, like seeing Stonehenge or a walking tour of Rome. Over 300,000 bookable experiences in 190 countries. Millions of real travelers' reviews. So you have the information you need to book the best activities for your trip. With Viator, there's always flexibility and support with free cancellation, payment options, and 24-7 service. So let's get out there and experience life, shall we? Download the Viator app now and use the code Via tour 10, get 10% off your first booking. One app, over 300,000 experiences you'll never forget. Do more with Viator. 
All right, uh, quick uh, pizza sausage update yeah. and clarification. I was in New York City, just oh. Mike and I, dragging that merch bag around, rolling that boulder up a hill. We went in to, I, the name escapes, we just popular in New York, you know, to buy a slice. This place had 13, 17 pizzas all laid out, you know, with all the Hawaiian style and then the, you know, everything, your meatball, every, everything. The only one they were out of was sausage. And I couldn't <laughs> see couldn't how see. they did yeah. the sausage. And I, I stood around and went, and went meatball. Uh, but when Doss, somebody tweeted me a picture. So I, I don't like the crumble sausage. When you're talking about picking off sausage, I like round hoops yeah, of sausage. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I don't mind the balls of sausage, the the marble size, grape size balls of sausage. What I don't like is the ground sausage. So when you were talking about picking off sausage, you were right. talking about the marble. I'm, I'm talking about a, a chunk of sausage without the casing. It's just Italian sausage. Yeah, you pick it. Pick yeah, it but off and throw but it on. but we're still <laughs> not, not cl- we're still not clear. What what I'm saying is is there's ground sausage I, and which crumbles the and it's dry. Yeah, and it rolls I'm, I'm aware that that exists, but I've never I've I've, I've seen it on pizza and it's generally but that generally on entire, a shitty pizza the, place. So the entire debate we were having wasn't. I was having a debate with two f- forms of sausage. You were doing three forms of sausage. Okay. I don't um Are the I I don't maybe are the balls and the and the crumpled sausage wouldn't those be considered more the same the same the thing? The balls of sausage that I think Dawson was talking about is marble size balls of sausage. Yeah, I know the, yeah. I know what you're talking about. And oftentimes cheesed over to be held in place. At least I've seen it that Yeah, way. the sausage I'm speaking what of. What I'm talking is, about is ground sausage that's dry yeah. that is basically like putting ground hamburger on top of your like, like right. putting taco meat right, taco on top meat. Oh, yeah i hear yeah. you okay there you go so this what would this be considered that's the, ground, the ground that's the ground that's the ground stuff but that's not the bald no no right now There's when the, dawson well. was talking about picking it off but dawson, the ground dawson's holding a huge ball when he's when he's miming the whole thing so i think that's why it's we're confused here yeah but you're not talking about ground sausage. You're talking. I'm not about- talking about ground sausage. I'm talking about basically Italian sausage that's not in a casing that you just peel a chunk <laughs> off and throw it on the plate. Right, right. But you weren't saying bald or chunks. You were just saying pull it off and throw it on the thing. Okay, we that's have right. three kinds of sausage on the screen, Doss. So we have the, right. the cut, cased sausage, the sliced sausage. In the middle is like the ground sausage. And then to your right... Are the bald sausage? The far right is the correct one. Ah, yes, that's the I one agree. you like. There All you right, go. now Thank I goodness. will take the cased sausage circles, or I will take the bald sausage. <laughs> but my big pushback was the crumbles. They need to have a shit. Yeah, the crumble. All right, All right. That I go was with the my, bald. That too. was my. That yeah. was my thing. All right. Oh, it looks good. Now man. we have we have clarity. Yeah. All right. What's going on in the news? Sure. Oh, by the way. Um, before we do that, you were in New York. Were the fires a big issue there? Yes. Did you see like the sky? Was it? It was dark and you could smell it and it was thick. And as the last story I saw before I headed to the airport was <laughs> New York City with the smoke blowing in from Canada. Yeah. And you know, those darn Canadians. My thing is, we gave them <laughs> acid rain, so we kind of deserve uh, it. Yeah. The payback. I think it's payback. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, one of my K Rock jokes from when I was like like 1994. I had this whole bit. Uh, maybe Geo can find it. Um, I I had this whole bit when I was doing Kevin and Bean, which is um, I think the bit was you know when there's trouble around the world, people go out in front of the embassy and they chant like like slogans, you know, down with the U.S. or they burn the U.S. flag or they, they, whatever the president at the time is, they burn an effigy and they do stuff. And I said, all these other places have all these chants and all these things ready to go against the United States, but we don't have any ready to go for them when the shit goes down. Where's our chance? Where's our, 
humiliating, degrading, negative chant. So my character, Mr. Birch, <laughs> wrote down like a whole bunch of stuff in case the shit went down in this part of the country, we'd be on the same page out in front of the embassy (laughs) shouting negative shit about their country, right? We need that. And so I can't remember. I remember like three of them. I remember Uruguay. (laughs) Uruguay was, what? You're gay? That was (laughs) Uruguay. (laughs) And then uh, Niger was, you're one G away from an ass kicking. And Canada was... Uh, we gave you acid rain. Uh, you gave us Alan Thick. We're even. <laughs> so oh. He was alive at the time. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. And I can't, Geo, I don't know. Someone will have to find the rest of it, but it was a long list yeah. of just. They probably still hold up. I'm sure they, Uruguay. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. You know, the other thing we owe them for is Canadian bacon on a pizza. Oh, that's um, not bad. AKA ham. Yeah, yeah. basically. Yeah. Yeah, I got. I'll hate that I say that. I got meatball, and it, it, it didn't. It wasn't great because I shaved it. And it was, anyway. mm, all, right, all right, here we go. So, mm-hmm. uh, Ted Kaczynski. I will say this: <laughs> in New York, they will give you garlic powder for your pizza, which I love the shit out of. Not garlic salt, too yeah. salty. Garlic powder. The powder. It's it's always there. It's always on display. You can use it as much as you want. And it's, it's right always there with there. the cheese and peppers. And, and why mm. not? Why, why and that never made it over to the U.S.? I mean, over to Cali. The, 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 the garlic powder. It's good. It's good on pizza. All right. Sorry. Agreed. Go ahead. Uh, so Ted Kaczynski, 81, reportedly found dead in his cell on Saturday at a North Carolina federal prison. Uh, though, though authorities so far have not revealed an official cause of death, the New York Times reported that he died by suicide, citing three people familiar with the situation. Mm. So Unabomber. Yeah, the Unabomber. So uh, a lot of people, um, you know, putting on their tinfoil hats now and liking it to Epstein's suicide. Mm-hmm. Was it a suicide? I mean, yeah, if, you, if you're a high-profile figure like this in prison and you die by suicide, I think everyone's just going to ask questions now. Yeah, but, I mean, this is – he's been in for 22 years or something. I know. Right? Yeah. They, they, he – he goes down in the annals of the worst use of a composite rendering sketch artist to find this man ever. <laughs> yeah. It's a picture of a white dude with a hoodie Good. up wearing sunglasses. The aviator sunglasses. Uh, you are a pair of aviator sunglasses and a hoodie away from all of us being this guy. Like yeah, this is zero. This is zero yeah. help in finding there you go. this person. And by the way, I I don't know if it's just me, but the composite looks exactly like John Holmes from 1983, like porn star. <laughs> it looks exactly like porn star John Holmes. You can find a 80s version of John Holmes, the porn star. It looks exact. That's all. That's all. I. That's all. It made me think of. This is anybody. Yeah, could mm-hmm. be anyone. Yeah, right. The worst. I think this is the worst. And one. And, and and never do facial hair in a police composite because that's the first thing that's going to get shaved. Because the guy's just <laughs> yeah. going to see a picture. Uh-oh. The guy's going to go, "Oh, I'm going to take this hood down. I'm going to shave my mustache. I'll take these sunglasses off, and now I'll be a completely different human being." Yep. In ten minutes, I'd like to see his merch bag. <laughs> he, he could sell a lot of those uh, hoodies. You must have met John Holmes, the porn star. I did meet John Holmes. He must, he must yeah. have been making the rounds around here. I'll tell you what, he was no Robin. No. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't he didn't take the penis shrinking pills. Uh, apparently not. Yeah. All right, take your time. That's a little, that's okay. Oh, I even got the sunglasses. Now, yeah. you can find John Holmes with a mustache. You need John Holmes with a, like, 80s perm John it Holmes it with a mustache. It might already be on the computer, Byron. <laughs> anyway. All right, he's gone. He'll be missed. <laughs> He'll be missed, yeah. I mean... Um, yeah, uh, just a reminder, admitted committing 16 bombings between 78 and 95. A Harvard-educated mathematician. Yeah. Yeah, there he is. Could have been Johnny Watt. Yeah. Yeah. His brother's the one that... Turned him in. Turned him in, yeah. But then um, it was like he worked out a deal. His brother worked out a deal with the FBI. Like, no death penalty, though. And the FBI's like, okay. That was the deal? No death yeah. penalty. Then they catch him and they go to back to the brother. Actually, death penalty is on the table here after what he did. So his brother became like a crazy activist against the death penalty because of that. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, he was sending bombs to like 
faculty at Cal and Stanford and stuff like that. It was weird. He wasn't a traditional serial killer, you know, preying on runaways and girls yeah, and stuff. He, he was he was a tech serial killer yeah. or something. I don't I don't exactly know. Most of, most of them were like packages for professors. Right. Yeah, that's why you call them the Unabomber. He had a different kind uni- of hit list. Universities and air airports, I think, right? So, uh-huh. Or airplanes, excuse me. So Unabomber, yeah. Um, Wait, what's the air? How's the airplane come in? Un, I'm guessing Un, uh, the A maybe in Bomber? Universities he, where's and the air- airports. He did I mean, airports? Airplane, airplanes, excuse me. He did airplanes? Yeah. Oh, he did? Yeah. He, like, he did one on an airplane where it exploded. And I think like a bunch of gas went into into the airplane. I don't think nobody died. I, I believe. Oh, he did an airplane. Huh. Yeah, I mean, I think that's. I think because of him, like another merchant. He, merch he actually grounded flights because of because of what he was doing. What's weird? I only heard professors. What was he going after the flights for? Huh. Well, yeah. Ben- oh, here, look. Um, uh, April ninety six. Oh, sorry. FBI called Nina Bomber because of his early targets seemed to be universities and airlines. An altitude triggered bomb he mailed in seventy nine went off as planned aboard an American Airlines flight. A dozen people aboard suffered from smoke inhalation. Wow! Mm. Wow! Yeah. A lot of range. A lot of range. So, uh, yeah. All right. Let's move on to uh, speaking of air airplanes. This this one's crazy. This is going to be a movie next year. Oh right? yeah. Um. Four Colombian children survived a plane crash and uh, and survived the Amazon jungle for 40 days. They were found 40 days later. Mm. Uh, these kids, by the way, aged 13, 9, 4, and like 11 months. Wow, yeah. 11 months. Yeah. Wow. So they were on board. So all four of these kids plus three adults were on a plane in the Amazon. They, the plane crashes. All three adults die. Mm. And so, and they have to fend for themselves. They what they did was um, one, they hid in tree trunks to protect themselves from the snakes, animals, and mosquitoes in the jungle. I don't know. I I heard that too. Like, how is hiding in a tree trunk? Every time I Isn't lean against a tree, live? I get a. I mean, I've never been inside a tree yeah. trunk. Myself. I lean against a tree and I get an ant on me. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. How, how, how would the all tr- the other animals have that idea? What are you? What are you yeah. thinking? Yeah, they're all running for the trunk. Sounds like Jurassic Park three. The, he, they, they must mean climbed the tree to get away yeah, from the... Yeah, it can't the, be the trunk. Yeah, maybe it was a animal. language yeah, diff- different, yeah. like a colloquialism. Hidden but. tree trunks. <laughs> I don't know. All right, anyway, go ahead. But yeah, so the hidden tree trunks, what they did was they survived because they took a cassava flower. There's a lot of cassava flower in the plane, and they just survived off of that. Why? Was there I don't know why. There's a cassava flower in the plane. The plane was packed with cassava flower. That's weird. I mean, def- I mean yeah, that could have been cocaine. I mean, this is Columbia. You know? Talk to yeah. Vinny about it. Still a lot of. Your uh, liver doesn't know the difference. Yeah, if people eat it like a pasta alternative with a cassava flour. It doesn't matter. Still high I can see that in the first, the first class. Uh, uh, Lounge? 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. Cassava oh, flour soup. Sure. No, one's t- yeah. no one's touching that soup. No. They're doing it on purpose. Yeah. They have to. They found these kids that are super fat. Cause it, <laughs> they never, there would never be a soup that you would find at a delicatessen that you would like in the first class lounge. That's all I'm saying. It's uh, a yeah. scam. It's a scam. <laughs> it's a scam. <laughs> um, also, the, uh, they, the siblings are found with two small bags containing some clothes, a towel, a flashlight, two cell phones. A uh, music box and a soda bottle that they and, and they had soda bottle they used to collect water in the jungle. So one of the kids, the oldest one, he had some survival training, I guess, wow. just a little bit. But yeah, I mean, they forty days. Did uh, better than incredible. I would do. I heard the mom died like three days after. Four days later, yeah, or four days after. Yeah, Jesus Christ. Well, I. I think these kids are going to be celebrities for like the rest of their lives, right? Right. It's like a Survivor episode. Do you think they could survive uh, Bear Grylls? Oh, Bear Grylls. Yeah. Oh. Man, I, and you know what it's good for? I'll tell you what's, you know what's going to do? It's going to get a lot of guys laid in about 15 years because every guy, what's their nationality? Every Peruvian guy uh, out there. Colombian. Every Colombian guy between the age of 21 and 26 is at a bar. Is just going to go, it's a great I'm, bar one, of those, I'm one of those. Yeah. No one's going to know. Right. They're not going to be able to call him out. It was hell. We had to bury my mom on day four. We lived off of uh, flour. We hid, <laughs> we hid inside of trees. And, and, and he's going to get a blowjob. 
Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's you a good story. You gotta get something out of that story. I could yeah. pass for Colombian, right? You could do that. Yeah. You could do it. Yeah, so what they did was, I mean, it's 40 days. I'm, I'm surprised they were still looking for these kids after that long, after finding the three dead bodies of the adults in the plane crash. Yeah. Um, so they sent 150 soldiers with dogs into the area. They were dropping off care packages into the jungle, just hoping oh, they these were. kids would find them. Yeah, because they found, like, footprints and stuff leaving the wreckage, uh, so they sure, knew. Yeah. But listen, don't they always tell you, stay at the wreckage, like, stay where you're at. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because that's where they're going to find first. Now they find the wreckage, but you're gone. Always hang out by the wreckage. That's all. That's yeah. A, yeah. Um, all right. Well, moving on. By the way, they're, they're, these kids are still in the hospital. They're being monitored for the next two weeks. Uh, moving on. So uh, more horses are dying during these horse races. Uh, two more died at Belmont Park. So uh, that And so all season long, horse, that horses have been dying. Kentucky Derby... Uh, where I mean the place where they have the Kentucky Derby, Churchill Downs, they lost about a dozen horses this year, or mm-hmm. a dozen horses. Each one, by the way, being heavily investigated. A dozen and, horses. Yeah, and dozen didn't they horses. lose a bunch out here? A yeah, years yeah, ago Santa in Santa Anita. Anita. Yeah. yeah, so it's 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 been a thing, kind of shadowing the sports <clears throat> over the last few years. Yeah, and so the big discussion now is: is this an outdated sport? Like, so many horses are dying. Obviously, we haven't figured out how to improve it. Yeah, well, we also, it's like, we're weird because cockfighting is illegal. And there's a Zanku chicken or Popeyes on every corner out here. Right. But you would be destroyed if you engaged in cockfighting, <laughs> although we eat tons and Consume. tons, tons of chicken. So we have these like really stout measures against, you can't have those brainless animals fight. And then the horses, big and majestic, and we don't eat them, and we got to shoot them, and that's fine. We don't have an issue. It's a weird dynamic. It's a weird dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not, like, I hate getting rid of, of old stuff that, that we had in the past. I think there's too much of it yeah. in general. I don't like when they start, you know, I, I'm not down with, the, oh, no, it's not Latino. It's Latinx now or yeah, Latinx yeah. or something. I was like, fuck right off. Uh, or, or what are your pronouns? Fuck off. Fuck off. But this is like one of those things where it's like, well, if a dozen horse, like, look, it's a lot of horses. You lost three horses nationally over a season or something. It's kind of like, well, all right, maybe not. But, Losing a dozen at one track at yeah, like that's one a lot. season and stuff like yeah. that, maybe it's time to take a look. Something's going on. Yeah. yeah. Well, Peter's very upset about it. Yeah. Obviously. So they're they're blaming the trainer. So in uh, Peter, you guys should call us when you're not upset about something. <laughs> I, that <laughs> that's what I like. That yeah, I, I'd like I've to talk to the ACLU and Peter when you weren't and when you were and Maxine Waters when you huh. weren't pissed off about something. I'd like to catch you on a good day. Yeah. Where you weren't outraged. A rare day, but a good day. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Peter's upset about this. They're blaming the trainer, obviously, because uh, oh, by the way, because these two horses that just died are the same trainer. Was it all the same trainer? Well, the, yeah. the, these two were. Oh, um, and uh, by the way, Peter also under the gun by a celebrity, mm. Pete Davidson. So he That's actually right. was just in the news for reaching out to Peter, leaving an explicit voicemail for Daphna Naminchevich, the uh, senior vice president of Peter's cruelty investigations department, after she released a statement condemning his decision to shop for a dog at a pet store in New uh-huh. York City. Right? He didn't adopt. He went shopping for a dog. He like, It was posted online. Mm-hmm. And so she called him out saying, look, there's all these other dogs you could adopt. What are you doing here? Right. And, um, and Pete Davidson decided to call Peta and left a voicemail. And this is what uh, he said. My name is Pete Davidson. This message is for Daphna. Um, the C- uh, thank you so much for making comments publicly that I didn't adopt a dog. I just want to let you know I'm severely allergic to dogs, so I have to get a specific breed. I'm only not allergic to Cavapoos and those type of dogs. And my mom's f-ing dog, who was two years old, died a week prior, and we're all so sad, so I had to get a specific dog. So why don't you do your research before you f***ing create news stories for people because you're a boring, tired f*** you and suck my d***. Oh. End of message. Yeah, he's very now, he didn't get the, He didn't get those uh, 
dick shrinking pills. I don't Apparently think not. that's what I heard. Yeah. <laughs> no one lives it down. <laughs> Nobody lives it down. I haven't heard one word from him. I've I've heard a lot of talk about PETA. Nothing about his cock not being as right. big as we think it is. No. Yeah. He has medium dick energy. All right. First off, why is he a celebrity? I I I I was so wrong about him. I'm like, how's the least funny guy from SNL a, a celebrity? And then why won't he go away? But he will not go away. Um, Just now, accept it. To be fair to Peta, Peta fired back and said, "There's other dogs that are hypoallergenic or whatever. That's yeah. not the not the only one." I don't know why you have to call Peta. And, and why is that dog the only one that's uh, not uh, not uh, you're not allergic to? Uh, the, uh, Peta said untrue. Oh, but I, yeah. I, who the hell knows? This is a this is a clash of people I hate, <laughs> I and I don't know. I, I don't know who to side with here. <laughs> and I yeah. have. Not, and by I don't the way, think you're siding with Peta, not Pete. I don't have a problem with Pete. I have a problem with us caring about him. Uh, that's that's my thing with him. But Peta, I, I anytime anyone wants to yell at Peta, that's fine. I have no idea why you would feel compelled to do that. Right. I understand. They wrote a shitty article about you that nobody cares about. Yeah. But all right. I love angry celebrity voicemails, though. That, you do that have to true. love those, yeah. You do. You do. I like angry celebrity voicemails, and I like celebrity assistants calling 911 after their celebrity OD'd and them trying to dance around what Who, they did. It's always a dance. They yeah. may have ingested yes. something at some point. <laughs> Just send an ambulance, would you? Yeah. 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 They were allergic to. Yeah. They're allergic to cockapoos yeah. or tea pots or cavapoo. Know, too many fucking yeah. poo dogs. Too many. Yeah. Uh, so. Our very own Glendale, California has been in the news lately. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. What now? Well, it it's all over Pride Month mm-hmm. and in the school district. So they just, uh, uh, several hundred people gathered in the parking lot of the Glendale Unified School District headquarters and split between those who support or oppose exposing young people to LGBTQ plus issues in school. Mm. Especially because they just declared Pride Month, um, so protesters had a scuffle last week as punches flew um, during uh, during this. And there's a lot of video of it. Is this video, guys? Yeah, go this ahead. Is, play. Let's uh, watch. So these this, are, and by the way, Glendale heavily Armenian. These are the Armos, not putting up for that shit. And so yeah, so people are f- like parents and supporters and protesters all fighting each other, like literally kicking each other while they're down. It's it's no injuries, no injuries reported. But um, one teacher even attempted to compare the Armenian genocide to the risk of suicide by LGBTQ plus youth uh, and said good. kids know. <clears throat> yeah. If so, it's it. <laughs> OK. So First imagine so. Armos, <laughs> imagine Mark Gierkes <laughs> hearing that. The, the, all right. Let me a couple things. The most miserable assholes on the planet work for an organization called GLAD. Which, <laughs> Which I always find very ironic. ironic. They're the angriest, most miserable cocksuckers on the planet. Almost as angry as Work for a place called Glad. Yeah. Yeah, but at least PETA's named after a bread that's not in a good mood (laughs) or a bad mood. These guys are named after being cheerful and happy, uh, and they're miserable. So that's, that's Glad. That is ironic. Again, be gay, do whatever you want, sleep with whatever you want, marry whoever you want, love whoever you want. That's fine. Yeah. Stop advertising. Just let's go back to it. I, I don't want to hear about the gay community. I don't want to hear about the black community. I don't want to hear about the Hispanic community. I don't want to hear the Latino, Latinas. Just it's community. It's called the United States. Get the fuck to work. Just get the fuck to work, everyone. It's called the United States. You get to do whatever you want. Stop breaking yourself off into groups. I've been screaming about this for eh, 15 years. More groups have emerged. Is it getting better? Is it helpful? Does it work? Does it fix anything? Answer is no, no, and no. Get off your high horse or they'll shoot it down in Santa Anita. Mm. Uh, Frazier Smith, everyone. Puck off is the name of his podcast. Also, shows, dates coming up. Got got a show coming up at the Roxy. Yeah. And that's uh, August 17th as well. And you can go, where should we go to find you, Frazier? 
Uh, at Fraser Comedy, F R A Z E R, at Fraser Comedy, and I'm on the MySpace. <laughs> and you can go to AdamCroll.com yeah. for all of my live shows Monterey and San Antonio, Pasadena, Boise, and Portland, and Honolulu, Ranch Mirage, which is probably Rancho Mirage, I'm guessing. Yeah. I hope so. Don't go to Ranch Mirage. Yeah, go to Rancho <laughs> Mirage. And until next time, it's Adam Crowley for Fraser Smith and Chris Max about saying, Mahalo. Mahalo.